detoxification of waste in body phase 1 and phase 2 we are living in a world of pollution in 1994 alone over 2.2 billion pounds of toxic chemicals were released into the environment by 2021 it had grown to 21 billion pounds that is an increase of 10 times so some of these chemicals enter in our body through various routes like uh, mouth elementary canal lungs skins eyes etc also our body produces a lot of metabolic waste products every day like ammonia bilirubin urea lactic acid etc in addition to this lots of bacteria live in our digestive system they too produce a lot of waste products which are toxin to our body these toxic byproducts are called exotoxins produced as a result of microbial activity in the human intestine the toxins are detoxified by biotransformation in the body most of the biotransformation takes place in liver exogenous compounds enter your body through four primary routes inhalation during breathing through nose and lungs these chemicals enter into your body then by ingestion through mouth and intestine transdermal through skin especially when the skin is oily many of these lipid soluble waste materials or toxins enter into our body then intravenous through the vein also it enters the exogenous or the waste materials from outside some of them are familiar to our body like food nutrients water oxygen etc or they might be foreign to the body example drugs pesticides solvents industrial chemicals etc the exogenous compounds which are foreign to the body are referred to as xenobiotics all these toxins whether exogenous or endogenous are not beneficial to the body but they are harmful so they need to be removed from the body since most of them are lipophilic their removal is not that easy they need to be converted to hydrophilic form and they need to be made less toxic or non-toxic this will be achieved by various biotransformation reactions most of them are achieved through the use of enzymes hepatic biotransformation convert toxic compounds into non-toxic less toxic water soluble compounds which can easily be eliminated biotransformation is a metabolic process whereby chemical modifications or alternations to these toxins happen with the help of enzymes and for the chemical transformation of these compounds specific enzymes are used the enzymes which are in use for biotransformations are specific to the toxic compounds this is a schematic representation of phase 1 and phase 2 detoxification process the toxins which are entering or which are produced in our body are insoluble in water or fat soluble these toxins are metabolic end products or toxins of microorganisms harboring our body it can also be pollutants from air water and land in addition to that food additives drugs alcohol toiletries beauty products etc are also there and these undergo phase 1 and phase 2 bio transformation most of this transformation takes place in liver with the help of different enzymes as a result they are converted into water soluble waste products uh, most of the new products are non toxic or less toxic and they get excreted mainly through kidney as urine or through gallbladder bile stool root hepatic transformation the chemical modification or alteration of compounds endogenous or exogenous happens in the liver via enzymatic activity as i said most of it is taking place in the liver in addition to that it can also take place in most of our body tissues but at a smaller level compared to liver and liver is a primary site of biotransformation and uh, you might be knowing the reason why liver is a main organ associated with biotransformation 
This is due to the large size of the liver and presence of highest concentration of biotransformation enzymes. And in the liver cells or in the cells of other tissue where this biotransformation takes place, the biotransformation enzymes exist in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, cytosol and to a lesser degree in mitochondrial membrane, nuclei and lysosomes of the endocytes or other cells which are taking part in biotransformation. After liver, the kidneys and lungs are the next major biotransformation sites. They do around 10 to 30 percent of the capacity of liver. The skin, nasal mucosa and intestinal mucosa also have some biotransformation capacity. Most of the xenobiotics entering the body are lipophilic. As a result, their removal is not that easy. They might get stored in the adipocytes in our body. Once it is stored in adipocytes, it is very hard to remove them. Since they are lipo lipophilic, they can easily penetrate the lipid membranes of the cell. They are transported by lipoproteins with blood and rapidly absorbed by the target organs. The excretory mechanisms of the body requires a certain degree of hydrophilicity for efficient excretion. And these toxins are lipophilic. Hence, they escape direct excretion from the body. They need to be converted into hydrophilic forms and also they need to be made less toxic or non-toxic. Lipophilic compounds are more absorbable and retainable. Hydrophilic molecules are less able to cross cellular membrane and are easily filtered out by the kidneys. So they get directly excreted through kidneys. What happens to lipophilic xenobiotic once they are inside our body? They might get excreted. If not excreted, lipophilic xenobiotics get accumulated in body tissues and become toxic to the body. It can cause cancer or even death of the cells. The main function of biotransformation is to make them less toxic and harmful by converting or biotransforming them to hydrophilic compounds and ena enable their elimination. The biotransformation is a continuous process happening 24 hours in a day, non-stop. And it is an energy consuming process. A lot of cellular energy is used for this. And a large variety of enzymes are in use for biotransformation. As biotransformation is carried by specific enzymes, which are specific to the compounds which are made non-toxic. Biotransformation enzymatic activity occurs in two sequential steps called phase 1 and phase 2. Phase 3 also occurs but the use of enzyme is quite limited in phase 3. Instead, transporter proteins are used. This is a flow chart showing biotransformation steps. So exogenous and endogenous toxins. Exogenous toxins are entering your body through lungs, intestine, skin etc. Endogenous toxins are produced as a result of your own metabolism and also are metabolic byproducts of microbes living in your body. So they all undergo phase 1 bioactivation then phase 2 biotransformation they are mainly conjugation process and phase 3 efflux process. Some of these toxins, exogenous or endogenous, directly go to phase 2 conjugation. As I said before, the pathways of biotransformation are divided into phase 1, 2 and 3. These reactions may occur simultaneously or sequentially. Phase 1 yields a polar, water-soluble metabolite that is often still active. Many of the products of this phase can also become substrates for phase 2. The reactions are of three types, oxidation with cytochrome P450 and that is the most common form of biotransformation. There are different types of cytochrome P450s. Then another process is reduction and also hydrolysis. Phase 2, adding endogenous hydrophilic groups to form water soluble inactive compounds that can be excreted by the body. In the phase 2, Hydrophilic groups are conjugated to the toxic chemicals or byproducts of phase 1. As a result, they become water soluble and also most, most cases they become inactive. 
and can be excreted by the body through urine, feces or through lungs. Sometimes it will be excreted through skin and also hair. These addition processes could be methylation, glucuronidation, acetylation, sulfation, conjugation with glutathione and conjugation with amino acids. Amino acids like lysine, taurine and glutamic acid are used for this. And phase 3 occurs after phase 2 where a chemical substance can undergo further metabolism and excretion. Excretion is achieved through different transporter proteins which are classified into two superfamilies that is ATP binding cassette ABC and solute carrier transportase SLC. Different phases in detail. Phase 1 bioactivation. It is an activation process where the toxins are made active biologically that is by using enzymes. This is a process where the enzymes act upon a compound to biotransform it. And during this phase, in most cases, the compound is only partially biotransformed, thereby creating an intermediate or metabolite of the original chemical compound, which has been bioactivated into a more chemically reactive toxic compound. So after phase one, most of the toxins are bioactivated into a more chemically reactive toxic compound. This reactive compound, if not fully biotransformed, will remain in the body. Their accumulation to the body is not harm, beneficial but is harmful. It becomes toxic to the cells and finally it may kill the cells or may lead to cancerous growth. And they can get stored in adipose tissue where it will be difficult to excrete. In phase 1, an enzyme can add a functional group to synobiotics. Oxidation and reduction takes place during phase 1 biotransformation. The most common oxidizing enzyme is cytochrome P450. Cyte P450 has the ability to reduce synobiotics under anaerobic conditions. So oxygen is not necessary. This causes lipid soluble xenobiotics to become more water soluble. The changes, the chemical changes or the bioactivation happening through phase 1 can make the substance inactive or active or may not be making any change. From this point, many chemical substances can be excreted directly in urine. For those substances that cannot be excreted yet, Pass to phase 2 biotransformation. Phase 2 the main process is conjugation. Conjugation with functional groups which makes them more water soluble. The bioactivated phase 1 intermediate is further acted upon by a different set of enzymes and undergoes further biotransformation. The result is a safer, non-toxic, water soluble compound which can easily be excreted. And this process is sometimes referred to as bioinactivation. The phase 1 was bioactivation. The xenobiotic is made into a more active compound. Here in phase 2 conjugation, this is bioinactivation, made inactive. One of the major phase 2 pathways in mammals except cats is glucuronidation. During glucuronidation, Glucuronic acid is combined with toxins. Glucuronidation almost always results in decreased potency and half-life of a chemical. So through glucuronidation, the potency of the chemical, the toxin is decreased and the half-life of the chemical is also decreased. As a result, the chemical becomes non-toxic or less toxic and its presence will be shortened as they get excreted. After bioinactivation in phase 2, the chemical will get excreted, which may pass through phase 3. Phase 3 is an efflux state, removing the water-soluble phase 2 conjugated compound from the cell. For this, transporter proteins are used rather than enzymes used in phase 1 and phase 2. Completely biotransformed compounds are removed from the cell. It will then be eliminated from the body via kidneys, bowel, breath, sweat, saliva or hair. 
completing the detoxification process. Enzymes used in biotransformation. There are numerous biotransformation enzymes. Each enzyme has an affinity for a certain molecular compounds or substrate. As you have already learned, enzymes have active size which is specific to particular compounds. So that specificity determines the affinity of enzymes to a particular xenobiotic. Regulation of the biotransformation enzymatic process is highly complex as some of the enzymes act on more than one compound or certain compounds are acted upon by more than one enzymes. So this makes the process quite complicated. Widespread variability in the regulation of biotransformation enzymes. So the regulation of biotransformation en enzymes are also a bit complex as there is widespread variability. There are individual variability there, variability based upon the chemical nature of the xenobiotics is there and also due to the concentration of xenobiotics. All this may makes it a bit complicated or complex. This determines the efficiency of the biotransformation process and this also the regulation, the variability in regulation also determine whether an individual is highly sensitive or reactive to xenobiotic compounds. So highly sensitive organisms or reactive organisms have less efficiency of for their enzymes. As a result, the toxic chemicals will get accumulated in their body and they are more sensitive or they experience worser effect of the toxins as they are slowly transformed and their accumulation is harmful to the cells. Some other individuals are more resilient and less sensitive. Their enzymes or biotransformation process is more efficient. As a result, the toxins, the xenobiotics are easily removed as a shorter period of time. The regulation, expression and activity of biotransformation enzymes and the extent of detoxification is determined in large part by two general factors. One is environmental factors, that is the level of exposure, how much of the xenobiotic center in your body and how low what is the route of ingestion for example if the route of ingestion is through the elementary canal some of the chemicals will not or fail to enter into your body cells they are removed or they just get excreted through the elementary canal especially through the use of antiportes which you will see later And then biochemical factors, that is purely depending upon the individual, an individual's unique level of biochemistry. Certain individuals, the metabolic process are quite efficient in removing xenobiotics. And this is referred to as biochemical individuality. Biochemical individuality is a simple concept that states all humans differ biochemically from others. It might be the genetic makeup of the organism or it should be the environment where he or she is living and also what type of food that person is taking in. Biochemical individuality directly affects the degree to which a chemical compound is biotransformed from person to person. Some of the factors that determine a person's level of biochemical individuality are endogenous compounds what compounds are present to what extent what are the endogenous compounds present in an individual and how much it is present so it depends upon two factors uh, the metabolic rate the physical activity and also depends on the microbial growth in that person then exogenous compounds this is determined by where that person is living if the person is living in a highly polluted environment, sometimes it may be professional exposure, sometimes it might be workplace exposure. As I said before, phase 1 bioactivation, phase 2 conjugation, phase 3 flux elimination and the level of biotransformation also depends upon what is happening during phase 1 bioactivation. That is, uh, the different types of the polymorphism of enzymes 
and phase 2 conjugation what are the conjugation reactions happening in the individual and this conjugation reaction as well as bioactivation reaction depends upon various factors in the body which are varying from individual to individual what type of food the person is consuming how physically active that person is where he is living and what is his genetic makeup all these determine the individuality of a person the genetic factors the rate of biotransformation vary between individuals due to the differences in the stru structure and the amount of specific biotransformation enzymes this is determined by the genetic makeup of the organism and the genetic variation in the structure and the amount of enzymes present individual is due to the polymorphism genetic polymorphism and factors affecting biochemical individuality as i said before there are non genetic as well as genetic factors the non genetic host factors such as disease stress obesity physical exercise and age during certain diseases biotransformation efficiency increase but through certain other diseases decrease the biotransformation efficiency stress also most cases decrease biotransformation efficiency then age elderly individuals are more sensitive to xenobiotics they are less less active lifestyle decrease the amount of blood flowing through the liver as a result less of the xenobiotics could be taken to the liver if less are taken to the liver less will be getting detoxified or getting biotransformed as a result greater part of the xenobiotics remains in the body they get accumulated in different parts of the body and become toxic to the cells so also as the age increases fewer biotransformation enzymes are produced as age increases general metabolism decrease this also affects the formation of biotransformation enzymes cofactors are another important determining factor differences in the availability of cofactors and nutrients causes very different biotransformation abilities from person to person so this is determined by daily change in nutritional status wide variety of environmental factors also regulate the interplay between inducible and inhibitory functions of the biotransformation process certain environmental factors induce biotransformation whereas certain others inhibit biotransformation process induces of biotransformation it can either monofunctional or multifunctional monofunctional affecting only one enzyme or one phase of biotransformation whereas multifunctional affect multiple enzymes or different phases or more than one phases of biotransformation monofunctional induces that increase phase 1 but not phase 2 that can result in bioactivation as a result increased formation of highly reactive metabolic intermediates will happen this metabolic intermediates accumulates in the body and cause damage to proteins rna or dna and affects body metabolism and it can even lead to mutation and cancer this increased phase 1 but normal or decreased phase 2 can cause the accumulation of metabolic intermediates which may cause increased inflammation cell death or cancer the increased biotransformation of multiple compounds potentially clearing and reducing availability of a desirable substance such as helpful medication so in certain cases especially when we are taking certain drugs for treatment of uh, different diseases biotransformation may not be very helpful because the drugs which we are consumed will get biotransformed easily as a result they will be removed from the body this reduces the half life of the drugs and also the efficiency of the treatment process induces of biotransformation in most cases multifunctional induces tend to affect both phases that is both phase 1 and phase 2 it might be increase in phase 2 activity and to either slightly increase phase 1 activity or slow phase 1 relative to phase 2 slowing phase 1 relative to phase 2 is generally a good phenomenon because as i said before the phase 1 may convert the xenobiotics into a more active metabolite which might be more toxic so their speedy removal is quite important 
if phase one is lower and phase two is faster, what happens is as and when these metabolic intermediates are produced, they will get converted into non-toxic products or water-soluble products and get excreted. So they will not accumulate in the body. Example, elagic acid. Elagic acid is a multifunctional inducer. It induces phase 2 while inhibiting phase 1. Elagic acid is present in fruits and nuts like raspberries, strawberries, cranberries, walnuts, pecans and pomegranates. So the consumption of these fruits and nuts daily will provide you a better biotransformation efficiency. Uh, D-limonin is another inducer. This is a strong inducer of both phase 1 and 2. This limonin is found in cranberry, dill seed and peel and juice of citrus fruits. Brassica vegetables stimulates both phase 1 and phase 2. The vegetables like broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, kale, choy, brussels sprout, etc. induce phase 1 as well as phase 2 biotransformation. Inhibition of phase 1 and phase 2 process. The inhibition happens when two or more compounds competing for the same enzyme. As a result, less enzyme will be available for converting or biotransforming each of these compounds. Inhibition is also caused by depletion of nutrients and cofactors. The depletion might be due to the insufficient nutrition and also due to the presence of large amount of xenobiotics. The ability to inhibit phase 1 or phase 2 is selectively used in pharmaceuticals. It can be strategic to inhibit phase 1 or phase 2 systems, generally more true for phase 1. For example, acute care in some poisoning includes administering the right phase 1 inhibitor. In certain cases of acute poisoning, the metabolic intermediate might be more toxic. So they need to be removed immediately on their release. For this, the phase 2 biotransformation process will be faster than phase 1. In such cases, we inhibit phase 1 using plant inhibitors. So this inhibition of phase 1 is done if it is the bioactive intermediate that is a real poison and needs to be avoided. This can give the body time to cope with the slowed stream of toxic production. The highly bioactive toxic intermediate is produced at a slow rate due to the inhibited phase 1. And hence, the body gets enough time to remove that toxic material by an increased speed or by a normal speed of phase 2 biotransformation. This here, acetaminophen, it's a painkiller. This will get detoxified by converting it into acetaminophen sulfate or acetaminophen glucuronide. They get excreted. Sometimes, an intermediate product will be formed that is N acetyl P benzoquinone imine. This is produced in liver by biotransformation phase 1. It is covalently bind to proteins. This chemical causes oxidative stress, hence, remove the GSH pool, glutathione pool. This is not beneficial to the body. This causes toxicity to liver. Hepatic toxicity is the result of. Formation of N acetyl P benzoquinone. This chemical, N acetyl P benzoquinone chemical, can combine with glutathione and form acetaminophen glutathione, a complex which will get excreted. So, this N acetyl P benzoquinone is more toxic than acetaminophen. As a result, this conversion, this addition, the conjugation with glutathione is important here. Also, it can be strategic to inhibit phase 1 when availability of phase 2 cofactors are limited by poor nutrition or large toxic burden. Due to poor nutrition, the cofactors for phase 2 will be available at a lower concentration. In such cases also, we need to slow down phase 1 or inhibit phase 1. 
or if the toxic burden is too high there are a lot of toxic chemicals and the phase 2 may not be efficient to cope with the large amount of metabolic intermediate produced by phase 1 in that case also phase 1 need to be inhibited ideally phase 1 and phase 2 detoxification mechanisms work synergistically so they are in a ratio so that the metabolic intermediate will not accumulate in your body more specifically as long as there is no deficiency of phase 2 cofactors if the body is capable enough to carry on the phase 2 efficiently the phase 2 reaction in general occurs faster than phase 1 reaction and the reason is simple as i said before in most cases the metabolic intermediate product have formed after phase 1 is more active and in many cases more toxic than the original compounds so as faster phase 2 will remove those chemicals immediately from the body system this prevents the build up of highly reactive bioactive uh, phase 1 intermediate compounds in the body if there is an imbalance in phase 1 and phase 2 if phase 1 detoxification is highly active and phase 2 detoxification is lethargic or if an individual is exposed to large amount of xenobiotics along with a weakened biochemical individual response here phase 1 is highly active and phase 2 detoxification is slow or lethargic and, at, and also individual is exposed to large amount of xenobiotics along with the biochemical individual response of that person is weaker imbalance between phase 1 and phase 2 can occur phase 1 is active phase 2 is lethargic if the person is exposed to large amount of xenobiotics and at the same time it his or her biochemical individual response is weaker then imbalance between phase 1 and phase 2 occur in such situations critical nutrients and cofactors can become depleted allowing unwanted compounds and bioactive intermediates to build up in the body's tissue this is called pathological detoxification those individuals are called pathological detoxifiers here phase 1 is faster as a result metabolic intermediate is accumulating in the body and phase 2 is lethargic so this accumulation happened this is pathological detoxification a condition which contributes significantly to free radical formation this condition significantly contribute for free radical formation and this lead to oxidative stress and ultimately tissue damage toxification happening in liver phase 1 bioactivation hepatocytes are bathed in blood as the blood passes through the sinusoids we can see that blood is directly uh, the cells of the hepatocytes are directly in contact with the blood passing through the sinusoids 70 percent of the hep hepatocyte surface membrane is in contact with the blood in the sinusoid this provides for a tremendous surface area lot of surface area for the chemicals to cross and reach the hepatocyte interior of the hepatocytes compounds especially xenobiotics can gain entry into the hepatocytes and also as i said before the liver has the highest concentration of biotransformation enzymes these two factors that is 70 percent of the hepatocyte surface is in contact with blood so large area for the xenobiotics to move from blood to the hepatocyte and also hepatocyte has the largest concentration the highest concentration of biotransformation enzymes the entry of xenobiotics into hepatocytes can happen through different ways they might be passively diffusing across the membrane the surface area exposed to blood is quite large as a result passive diffusion once the chemical diffuses into the liver, it will get converted, biotransformed, bioactivated. So they are removed. So the concentration within the liver is kept limited and this will favor diffusion. 
they may get exchanged between blood transfer proteins and the sinusoidal membranes. Their carrier proteins may bind to sinusoidal membrane receptors and then undergo endocytosis. So receptor bound endocytosis. Diffusion change with blood transport proteins and receptor mediated endocytosis. Cell is absorbing or engulfing these chemicals. Once mobilized into the hepatocyte, the unwanted compounds come in contact with the enzymes. Come in contact with the active site of the enzyme and the catalytic activity of the enzyme they get converted. First is the phase 1 enzymes followed by phase 2. Phase 1 enzymes. Phase 1 enzymes are lipid membrane bound proteins. So these are proteins which are bound to lipid membrane. And these enzymes are mostly found in the endoplasmic reticular membrane. The primary function of phase 1 enzyme activity is to either biotransform a toxic lipophilic compound directly to a more hydrophilic compound, enable its direct excretion in the kidneys. Phase 1 usually results in only a small amount of direct hydrophilicity and excretion. The bulk of phase 1 enzymatic activity takes place in the form of altering unwanted compounds in a way to either expose or introduce a functional group. So during the phase 1 activity, most of the reaction is to add a functional group to the xenobiotic. Functional groups such as carboxyl group, hydroxyl groups, amino groups, sulfhydryl groups or thiol groups are introduced. Due to the enzymatic activity, the xenobiotics are bioactivated and forms activated intermediate. This will give rise to the formation of a more reactive and potentially more toxic and harmful substance than the original compounds. Therefore, it must be acted upon rapidly by antioxidants and or by phase 2 enzymes. Often a single compound goes through a series of 2 to 3 phase 1 reactions before it is ready for phase 2. Depending upon the chemical nature of the xenobiotic, certain compounds goes through a series of phase 1 reactions. It might be 2 or 3 reactions before it is ready for phase 2. This is a bit, bit complicating matter. It may occur in different parts of the cell like endoplasmic reticulum, lysosomes, mitochondria, etc. and give rise to increased opportunity for toxic intermediate to encounter a target molecule and have a toxic effect during the transition. So due to the production of more active and more toxic chemical, there is a chance the intermediate will encounter a target molecule and resulting in a toxic effect during this transition process. So the transition process needs to be speeded up and phase 2 reaction needs to be faster than phase 1. As I said before, phase 1 enzymatic activity occurs by means of one of the three possible chemical reactions like hydrolysis, reduction or oxidation. The type of reaction depends upon the chemical nature of the original compounds and also the presence of the enzyme present in the body. It also depends on the nature of the phase 1 enzyme present in the cell. Lysis is a process of addition of water molecule. In this process, the xenobiotic molecule is cleaved into two parts by the addition of a molecule of water. S plus ions from the water will go to one part. One fragment of the parent molecule gets heightened ion from the additional water molecule. The other fragment collects the remaining hydroxyl group, a functional group, and thereby prepares the compounds for phase 2. The major enzymes associated with the, act the actions of hydrolysis are esterases, peptidase, epoxide hydrolyse. Then the reduction, as you know, is a process of moving electrons from one element to another element during a chemical reaction. It is opposite of oxidation, whereby oxygen is removed. During oxidation, oxygen is removed or at least one electron is added during chemical reaction. The major reduction associated with phase 1 are azo reduction, disulfide reduction, 
nitro reduction, carbonyl reduction, quinone reduction, reductive dehalogenation, sulfoxide reduction. Majority of phase 1 reactions are oxidation reactions with the help of oxidative enzymes. A large family of oxidative enzymes are present in cells for carrying out the phase 1 oxidation reactions. Mixed function oxidizers or monooxygenases are present. These enzymes introduce oxygen into the chemical structure of unwanted compounds or xenobiotics, creating bioactivated intermediates such as reactive oxygen species. These reactive oxygen species, also known as free radicals, can be extremely toxic. Far more than the original compound, it can lead to diseases like diabetes, cancer, etc. Common phase 1 transformation enzymes, cytochrome P450, monooxygenase, CYP450. The most extensively studied mechanism of xenobiotics is the action of cytochrome P450 enzyme. They constitute a super family of proteins and contains a cofactor that are responsible for metabolism of xenobiotics and metabolic waste. Involved in the metabolism of nutrients, fatty acids, cholesterol and steroid hormones. These enzymes are widely distributed throughout the body with the greatest concentration in the liver and in tissues exposed to the external environment like skin, intestine, lungs, eyes, etc. As well as the kidneys, adrenals, testes and brain. The cytochrome P450 system processes more compounds than all the rest of the phase 1 enzymes combined. So that shows its efficiency. Each human CYP450 enzyme appears to be expressed by a particular gene. And most compounds are largely metabolized by a single CYP450 enzyme. Most of the compounds, xenobiotic compounds or toxic compounds are metabolized by a single CYP450 enzyme. There is a lot of overlap and redundancy in this system. For example, one CYP450 enzyme may be involved in the metabolism of one or more substrates. As we have seen before, the complicated system of detoxification, one enzyme will act on more than one compound or one compound may be acted upon by more than one enzyme. One compound that is a single substrate may be acted upon by multiple CYP450 enzymes. CYP450 enzyme detox by both endogenous and exogenous compounds. Only the chemical nature is important. The cytochrome P450 family of biotransformation enzymes can be induced by numerous compounds except for CYP2D6 which cannot be induced. Several compounds are known to induce C450 enzymes like air pollutants, petroleum derivatives, solvents, organochlorines, herbicides, pesticides, acetate, paint fumes, dioxins, carbon tetrachloride. Most of these environmental toxins that enter your body induce C450 enzyme. Then drugs like acetaminophen, diazepam, sleeping pills, contraceptive pills, steroids, barbiturates, sulfonamides, sulfonamides, sulfur drugs, nicotine, ethanol, alcohol, caffeine, phenobarbital. And foods like charcoal broiled fats, saturated fats, high protein diets, brassica vegetables, D-limonene. Then food supplements like thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, ascorbic acid, protein powders and St. John's wort. So most of the chemical materials either entering from your environment or you are taking as drugs or along with the food and certain food supplements induce cytochrome P450 enzyme. As a result they become active and these chemicals are biotransformed and removed from the body and save the body from their toxic effect. And likewise there are so many inhibitors of cytochrome 450 are also present. They can cause substantial problems as it makes toxins potentially more damaging remaining in the body longer before. So these in inhibitors cause substantial problem to our body because they inhibit this activity of cytochrome P450 which is the most efficient enzyme in the body in biotransformation. As a result the toxins will remain longer in your body and cause toxic effect. 
such blocking results in build up of more toxic compounds in tissue can lead to a spreading phenomenon with increasing sensitivity to more chemicals such as perfumes colognes cleaners detergents and many other environmental chemicals the presence of these inhibitors make you more sensitive to these compounds which you use daily also the spreading phenomenon can eventually cause an individual to become sensitive and reactive to even natural chemicals occurring in foods pollen and molds that is why suddenly certain individuals become sensitive to certain chemicals you might get exposed to these inhibitors and they inhibit the cytochrome p450 enzyme and your body is not able to bio transform these chemicals as a result you become sensitive to this chemical and they cause damage to your tissue a severely ill chemically sensitive person have low anti pollutant enzyme they have low bio transformation enzymes in addition to suppression of bio transformation enzymes and also the depletion of cofactors due to improper nutrition in some instances antibodies are produced against cytochrome p450 enzymes and many of these antibodies inhibit or decrease their effectiveness some examples of substances that inhibit cytochrome p450 enzymes are chemicals like carbon monoxide drugs like hydrogen blockers their use of rancid reflux benzodiazepines antihistamines antifungals barbiturates foods like naringenin flavonoids in great fruit curcumin capsaicin cyan eugenol quercetin etc will inhibit supplements like quercetin calendula n acetyl cysteine endogenous uh, gut bacterial endotoxins or exotoxins will also act as inhibitors being as well as hypoxia inhibit cytochrome p450 activity other oxidative enzymes of phase 1 as as mentioned before well over 100 mixed function oxygenase enzymes used in the phase 1 hepatic bio, bio transformation process some of the other more common phase 1 bio transformation enzymes are flavin containing monooxygenase fmo alcohol dehydrogenase aldehyde dehydrogenase aldehyde oxidase xanthine oxidase diamine oxidase monoamine oxidase molybdenum hydroxylase as to congestion happens during this phase most compounds enter phase 2 as phase 1 bioactivated intermediate some compounds directly enter into phase 2 so some endogenous and exogenous compounds bypass phase 1 and enter phase 2 directly phase 2 further bio transform compounds into a less toxic more hydrophilic compound to do this phase 2 incorporates the use of another type of enzyme called transferase enzymes so in phase 2 transferase enzymes are used for conjugation for catalyzing conjugation reaction transferase enzymes is a family of enzymes that catalyze the transfer of various chemical groups from one compound to another in hepatic bio transformation the transferase enzyme transfers and attaches a cofactor to the exposed functional group of the entire phase 1 intermediate so in the hepatic bio transformation the transferase enzyme transfers and attaches a cofactor to the exposed functional group of the intermediate that enters into phase 2 this intermediate from is from the phase 1 the process is referred to as conjugation so in conjugation in phase 2 conjugation in phase 2 transformation the conjugation happens on the intermediate which are produced by phase 1 here what happens is the enzyme transfers and attaches a cofactor to the exposed functional group of the intermediate For examples of certain cofactors acetylation in the acetylation pathway the enzyme is n acetyl transferase cofactor is acetyl coenzyme In amino acid conjugation glycine can be cofactor or taurine can be cofactor glucuronidation 
glucuronic acid is the cofactor, enzyme is glucuronosyl transferase. Glutathione conjugation, glutathione S transferase is the enzyme and glutathione is the cofactor. Methylation, methyl transferase is the enzyme, methyl group is the cofactors. Individual compounds that enter phase 2 usually follow one or two distinct pathways. Once a compound has become conjugated via one of the phase 2 pathways, it has now completed the biotransformation process of becoming hydrophilic. So once the compound has become conjugated by phase 2, it has become hydrophilic and ready for transport out of the cell. The detoxification can happen in many ways by the addition of cofactors or functional groups. For example, acetylation. Enzyme is n acetyltransferase cofactor is acetyl coenzyme. And the nutrients needed is pantothenic acid and vitamin C. They act as inducers and their deficiency act as inhibitors. Amino acid conjugation. Several amino acids, primarily glycine and taurine, are used to get with and neutralize toxins. Glycine is the most commonly utilized and is referred to as glycination. For glycination, bile acids are conjugated with glycine and taurine. Taurine deficiency leads to liver congestion of toxins. Inducers are glycine and taurine. Inhibitors, low protein diet, carboxylic acids are the substrates. So both glycine and taurine dependent reactions require an alkaline pH. In environmental medicine, pH is increased in over acidic patients by administering sodium and potassium bicarbonate. In environmental medicine, the pH of body is increased in over acidic patients by administering sodium and potassium bicarbonate in order to facilitate a biotransformation process by conjugation to detoxify xenobiotics. Glutathione conjugation. Glutathione is a tripeptide of glycine, cysteine and glutamic acid. Glutamic acid, cysteine and glycine. Primary enzyme is glutathione S transferase. In this, glutathione acts as cofactor. Vitamin C increases glutathione stores by stimulating the rate of glutathione synthesis. And inducers are elagic acid, brassica vegetables, and D limonene. Inhibitors, deficiency of selenium and B12, and also zinc. Phenols, amines, and thiols are detoxified by glutathione conjugation. Methylation involves conjugating methyl group toxins. Enzymes methyl transferase, cofactor methyl groups like S adenosyl, methionine, SAM. Nutrients needed. Methyl groups comes from S adenosyl methionine, and this is needed for this methylation reaction. The methyl transferase enzyme activity dependent on magnesium. As a result, magnesium deficiency. Magnesium deficiency will reduce methylation as a, and uh, supplementation of magnesium is needed during deficiency. Methylation is used in detoxification of phenols and amines. Phase 3 efflux. The small intestine is the first site of xenobiotic exposure. We take food and a lot of chemicals which are toxic to our body and this into the alimentary canal from there which will be absorbed in the blood and reach liver and biotransformation takes place. Levels of intestinal cytochrome V450 are reported to be much less than those in liver. So intestinal intestine has less amount of cytochrome P450 compared to liver. This gives an impression that intestine has very low role or relatively no role in detoxification process. But recently, this thought is changed. But now, the intestine, is, the intestine are now being recognized as having a major role in biotransformation process. This is in part because of the phase 1 and phase 2 activation found in enterocytes, along with the biochemical mechanism referred to as antiporter. So, the antiporter system as well as phase 1 and phase 2 activities found in enterocytes tell us intestine are active in biotransformation 
antipoto. Antipoto is an energy dependent flux pump. So the cell transport protein contained within the endrocytes lining the alimentary canal whose function is to export unwanted compounds immediately back into the intestinal lumen. So the toxic chemicals, certain chemi toxic chemicals while passing through the intestinal alimentary canal enters endrocytes. The antiporter will send it back into the intestinal lumen. As a result, they will not be absorbed into the circulatory system and they will not reach liver and there is no need of biotransformation. Once the exported and wanted compounds arrives back into the intestine, they have the following fate. It can be eliminated in the stool or it can re-enter the endrocytes only to be exported back out into the intestine and start the cycle over again. So they re-enter the endrocytes, then they will be sent back again into the intestinal lumen. Then it can enter the endrocytes and pass into the bloodstream and reaches the liver and biotransformation takes place. It can re-enter endrocytes and be acted on by the phase 1 C34A enzyme present in the endrocytes. And they, this, this enzyme do the biotransformation process before it is passed into the bloodstream. This enzyme start the biotransformation process before it is passed into the bloodstream to travel into the liver. So once the xenobiotics reach the alimentary canal, they enter into the endrocytes and they will be sent back into the alimentary canal by the antiporter. So after this, they can be excreted or they will re-enter into the endrocytes and the process will be repeated. They will be sent back into the elementary canal. That is the second option. Third one is from there they will be passing, they will reach the blood. From the endrocytes, these chemical, these xenobiotics enter the blood and take into the liver and biotransformation takes place. Or the cytochrome enzyme CYP3A4 present in the endrocytes start the biotransformation process and the intermediate will be passed to the blood and reach the liver and complete the biotransformation.